Ismail is an orthodox Christian content creator. He made a video titled Islam is a false religion. He tried to debunk and refute Islam, but let's say he failed miserably. The Quran gets history completely wrong. The Messiah in Islam literally makes no sense. Jesus was clearly not a Muslim. The Talmud is not considered, even by Islam's own standards, to be the word of God. Inshallah in this video I'm going to address some of his points and respond accordingly. So without wasting any time. Unfortunately he's going to waste a monumental amount of time. Precisely 16 minutes of time to be exact. And let's see if you're going to bring anything new or just repeat the same repetitive Sam Shaman type arguments. You're in your car right? Yes. Okay that's one car right? Already off to a weak start pointing at some random Christian online, whether they're famous or not, talking about a heretical concept of the Trinity does not in any way disprove what Kyle or what I say. We don't appeal to Sam Shamoon at all in the video, and there are many people who do without using the heresy of partialism. First of all, you're assuming that the Bible is a true historical book and a reliable source of information when it is not. Citation needed, please. Assertions made without evidence will be dismissed without evidence. Because you have nothing in the Bible naming the religion of any prophet. God never called his people in the Old Testament to follow a religion named Judaism. And Jesus السلام, never asked you to follow a religion named Christianity. Only about two minutes in and we're already resorting to the word concept fallacy. The name of something does not have to be in a book for the concept to exist. You would say that Tawheed exists in Islam, yet Tawheed, the word, is not found in the Quran. You talk about one God and monotheism, which is a Greek Hellenic term, and yet the word monotheism does not appear anywhere in the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the Quran. Therefore, by your standard, the Quran, the New Testament, and the Old Testament do not teach any monotheism, nobody does, and the Quran does not teach Tawheed. So even the name of your religion is man-made and not from God Almighty. Again, by your logic, the religion of Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and Noah cannot be Islam because the word Islam nor Muslim do not appear in the Old or the New Testament. In addition to that, it is ironic that you are calling this religion man-made when your own religion steals the exact description that Plotinus gives in his Aeneids centuries before Islam when he calls his version of God the one, the absolute, which is exactly what the Quran does when it refers to God. If anything is man-made, it would be from you. We don't do them now are abrogated. We believe in progressive revelation, and you do too. And oh really, progressive revelation? Then why do you guys complain about Paul abrogating the law of Moses if it is perfectly acceptable for your prophet to abrogate the law of Moses and the commands of Christ? Secondly, if your great argument is that Christians are not true because they don't keep the Torah commands, be surprised to look at some of the videos I've done on this subject where I prove the Apostle Paul does not eradicate the law of Moses, Jesus does not eradicate the law of Moses, and the New Testament does not teach to get rid of wholesale the law of Moses. So I guess I'm immune from your argument there. KJV Old Testament was translated from the Masoretic Hebrew text. So the most popular Bible is based on the Masoretic text manuscripts, which are dated 400 years after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Something being the most popular does not automatically mean that it's true. Second of all, people who adhere to the KJV translation of the Old Testament can actually read the Septuagint in the style of the King James Version or the New King James Version which is used quite often in the Orthodox Study Bible which is the official Bible for Eastern Christians and Eastern Christians, particularly the Eastern Orthodox, use the Septuagint. So before we even get off on any tangent, your appeal to the Masoretic does not really make any sense when there are millions, hundreds of millions of people who do not use the Masoretic as their root or their base for the Old Testament. Kyle and I would be two of those, so you're replying to the wrong person if you're looking at the dating of the Masoretic text, which we admit is different in its dating than the Septuagint. 
However, it must be clarified that Septuagint is not the original Bible, it is a Greek translation of an older Hebrew version. And all secular scholars maintain that the Bible translation that is being quoted and referenced the most in the New Testament is the Septuagint, followed by a different kind of Old Testament in the Hebrew, which is still about 99% the same as the Septuagint, only a little bit of the wording or pacing may be slightly different. But the theology, the content, and the history is exactly the same. So we have an ancient, pre-Septuagint Hebrew copy, which we know had to exist. The Septuagint has to be based off of something, it is not the original Torah. And we know that hundreds of millions of people use the Septuagint as their foundation, including many Protestants who will compare the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. So again, you're just appealing to something because it's popular, therefore the Bible is debunked. There are many things that are popular that may be wrong. The Septuagint and the Syriac Peshitta actually avoid many of these so-called contradictions that are brought up in the Old Testament, such as the age of certain kings. Theoretic texts, traditional Hebrew texts of the Jewish Bible, meticulously assembled and codified and supplied with diacritical marks to enable correct pronunciation. This monumental work was begun around the 6th century AD and completed in the 10th. I can tell you're going to use this argument a lot, so I have to debunk it right away. Appealing to the dating of a manuscript means nothing. Because we have records of people using the paper or text that they're referencing long before the dating of this oldest manuscript. Just because we only have one surviving manuscript from one certain period of time does not mean that that's when the book was written. We clearly have records of great saints such as St. Augustine reading the Old Testament in its old Latin formulation and not using the Greek copy or the Septuagint which was popular in the eastern half of the early church. Which means 400 years after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah, they are the ones believing in a book written after the Quran, not the other way around. Something being recorded again does not mean it's precise. The Quran is not a book that comes in isolation. It is talking about events and revelation that happened before the time it was revealed to Muhammad in Arabia. Therefore, it has to match some kind of a semblance, even if it's not 100% to the stories that come before it, because the vast majority of the Quranic narrative is talking about prophets which are from the Bible. Muslims always appeal to this third party, secular, true historical version of Moses and Jesus, etc. But there's very little to zero evidence, essentially, of these people existing in a way different from what is described in the Bible. The origin, if we were secular people, of the character of Moses is in the Torah. Therefore, we cannot have a Moses who is completely divorced from the Torah, otherwise the word Moses becomes a gibberish. The character of Moses in the Quran is different. The purpose of his story is different. The manner of worship is different. Therefore, the word Moses doesn't really mean anything. Because as I said, Moses comes from the Torah. There is no secular third-party Moses to appeal to. And all of these secular reports of Jesus confirm exactly what the Gospels say. That he was handed over, by the Jews to Pontius Pilate, that he was killed, and that he was resurrected by God, or at least people believed he was resurrected by God. We can see this in the letter of Abgar, and we can see this also in the history of Josephus and the history of the early church. All of these people believed that Christ died and that he rose from the dead. So even if we had no gospel whatsoever, which St. Paul did not have, as he was going about the Eastern Mediterranean evangelizing and converting people, he would still have that core narrative, which is that Jesus died and was resurrected. So even if we don't have the New Testament, appealing to a secular, true historical Jesus is not going to work unless you want to admit conspiracy theories like Reza Aslan. Ignatius of Antioch said in his epistle to the Magnesians chapter 9, If therefore those who were brought up in the ancient order of things have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath, but living in the observance of the Lord's day, on which also our life has sprung up again by him and by his death, whom some deny. So according to your own church father Ignatius, some early Christians didn't believe in the death of Jesus alayhi salam, just like the Quran and confirms. It actually doesn't confirm it. It says that people did believe he was crucified, but he wasn't. In addition, saying some obscure group did something, therefore it has to be true, is a wild claim. That's why Muslims are always appealing to the Ebionites and other strange sects that have essentially no weight whatsoever on the Old or New Testament, no authority, and they certainly do not match or have any kind of coherence with the theology found within the Bible. The Essenes, the Ebionites, any of these groups don't seem to make any sense. If you're going to make an appeal to a strange, obscure group, 
you would probably appeal to a group like the Nazarenes from the Jordanian desert. But the Nazarenes believed that Jesus did pre-exist. He was the Son of God. He was divine in a way, although we have no evidence of what their Trinitarianism or lack of Trinitarianism may have been. And they kept the entire law of Moses and identified as Jews. There's no evidence that they were waiting for another prophet. There's no evidence they thought even one iota, one dot, as Jesus says, of the law of Moses was ever abrogated. So if there is no trinity and Jesus is a divine son of God, he still died for the sins of mankind, alcohol has not been abrogated, and the law of Moses still stands. If that is the religion that we're looking at that could be the true religion, why would somebody go to Islam? So repent and come back to the truth. Come back to true monotheism. And stop promoting human blood sacrifice and the worship of human beings. I wouldn't talk about worshipping human beings when it is necessary in your religion to idolize a man who claims he was a mere mortal man that did not want to be elevated to the level of Jesus, which is what Christians had done to the Messiah in a hadith. Additionally, it's not a human blood sacrifice. The sacrifice is replete throughout the entirety of the Torah and the rest of the Tanakh, which, by the way, the Quran mentions the animal sacrifices as well as the temple. So if the temple and the animal sacrifices are not fake history, but are actually part of the revelation of God, how can you say that Jesus matching the description of sacrifice is a pagan human blood sacrifice? If Jesus did not match the description of sacrifice, Muslims would be sitting here on YouTube today saying, why does Jesus contradict the Old Testament? The Old Testament has sacrifice but Jesus did not sacrifice. Clearly, you would not be pleased either way. But Christ takes on the sacrifice of man just as Phineas, son of Eleazar, atoned for the entirety of his people in the book of Numbers without them having to atone for themselves. As God says, the sin, as God says, the punishment for sin is always death. If it is not your death, it is the death of the animal, which is your substitutionary atonement. And if it is not the animal, then it is Christ. And that is what we have in the renewed covenant of Abraham or the new covenant, which is where the idea of the New Testament even comes from. But later on, after the Muslims were strong in their faith, it was prohibited. Or you have believed, indeed intoxicants, gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid it that you may be successful. Well, hold on. If alcohol is the work of Satan, why is it acceptable prior to the arrival of Muhammad? Secondly, how is it that people by nature change where alcohol was not considered too sinful for them prior to Muhammad, but it is considered too sinful to them after the arrival of Muhammad? Are you saying that by nature human beings change? Because by then you would be appealing to the chain of being by which human beings are either raised or lowered on the chain of being and become different in their universal nature. And now you are appealing to Hellenism. So any idea that human beings evolve and become different at a certain period of time is the idea of the great chain of being, which I doubt you even understand. This is what we call a progressive revelation. And you should believe the same thing since you follow the New Testament and not the Old Testament. This is complete nonsense. Christians do follow the Old Testament, which is why it's part of the Bible. I think what you were aiming to say is that we are no longer part of the Sinaitic Covenant. But neither were Adam, Noah, Abraham, or anybody else before Moses. Only after Moses is the Covenant of Sinai established, where the works of the Law of Moses guarantee life and perseverance in the land of Canaan. The covenant that we have now is a renewed version based on the contract that Abraham had with God. So yes, there are various covenants in the Bible. The fact that you don't know about any of these goes to show the startling lack of information that your theological process has on what our theological process is. That is the earliest manuscript of the Talmud. Remember, they are claiming the Talmud was before the Quran. The oldest extant manuscripts are from the 11th or 12th century, with the oldest dated one was written in 1177. You're doing it again. You're looking at the oldest surviving manuscript, which is exactly what it says on the website. The oldest surviving manuscript, and you're claiming that is when the book was written. But if you've done even an ounce of research on the Talmud, which you clearly have not, you will see that it was compiled in the 500s. It was written over the course of multiple centuries and took a while to compile. The Talmud, by the way, is not a book sent by God, nor is it based on ink on paper. Talmud literally is about oral tradition, of classical rabbinic Judaism. So even if there isn't a written version of it, there will be the oral tradition. All academic scholarship denotes that the Talmud was compiled in the 500s. Just because there is a manuscript and the oldest surviving manuscript is from the 12th or 14th century, 
does not mean that that's when that narrative takes place, nor does it mean that that is the oldest copy ever written. It's just the oldest copy that people happen to have. But we still had the Talmud long before any of these so-called surviving manuscripts come into play. As I stated earlier, you try to skirt around the issue of the Quran copying the Talmud by saying the Talmud could have come later, even if I concede and give you that point. The morality found in this idea of killing one person means you have killed the entire world, and saving one person means you have saved the entire world, is completely unbiblical. The way that God does morality in the Torah is via tribalism. When he commands Moses to eradicate and burn down entire villages, slaughtering every single life form in there, regardless of their age, regardless of their occupation, regardless of their sex, do you think God said, go and kill all of those people, and then he turned around and said, why would you kill all of those people, Moses? Don't you realize that if you've killed one person, you've killed the entire world? No, God never says that to Moses, because God wanted Moses to erase certain villages and blot their name out from memory. Why? Because paganism and the lives of those who practice paganism does not measure up to the religion of God, the biblical religion, and the lives of those who practice that religion. That is why it says clearly in the Torah commands, you shall not hate your brother, your fellow Israelite. It says nothing about not hating pagan enemies outside of the flock. Even when Jesus says to love your enemies, he's talking about your personal enemies in your life, not people who want to behead and burn down your civilization. Otherwise, Moses and Joshua would have been sinners, because when they slaughtered pagans in the name of the Almighty God who sent them, they would have been killing, as you say, the entirety of the world. This is an extrapolation of universal morality based on Plato's Timaeus, not based on the Jews or the God of the Bible and his shepherd prophets. And this is my brothers and sisters, how we refute their lies. What you'll never refute is why the Quran calls God the very same name the Plotinus calls God, the one, the absolute. This is your so-called Babylonian Talmud. It was written in France in 1342, centuries after the Quran and not before it. Again, I already dealt with that. You can ask anybody who has practiced or is a theologian of classical Judaism. They have been following the oral tradition of their sages in one form or another via the oral practice of the Talmud since at least the 500s. They do not require a written manuscript copy surviving in order to memorize their oral traditions. That's why it's called oral tradition. Aren't it the Muslims who are always claim? Isn't it you Muslims who are always claiming that if every book in the world was incinerated, the Muslims would at least be able to memorize the Quran and that's why you memorize it in the original Arabic in the first place? So why can't the Jews do that for a book of theirs literally called the Oral Tradition? That is what the Talmud is supposed to be about. So it is oral tradition. It does not require the earliest manuscript. I never thought there would come a day where I, of all people, would be defending the veracity of the Talmud. Muslim child we know that what he just said is completely false. The Torah is not the Old Testament. The Torah was revealed to Moses alayhi salam. The Injil was revealed to Jesus alayhi salam. But these are not the only scriptures that the Quran accepts as revelations from God Almighty. We also believe in the scrolls of Abraham alayhi salam and we believe in the Zabur of David alayhi salam. We accept all the scriptures of all the prophets of God Almighty. Citation needed. As I stated earlier, an assertion made without evidence will be dismissed without evidence. The scrolls of Abraham, the notebook of Joshua, the pen and paper of Noah, the clay tablet of Adam. There is no evidence for any of these magical books that you state exist. The only reason you appeal to them is so that you can say, as I stated earlier, you have some kind of a semblance to the biblical prophets without having to keep biblical theology because of course your theology does not match biblical theology. So there is no evidence for any of these other books. Simply claiming we believe in this instead of that is not an argument. I could very well invent a book right now called The Sea Scroll. I could say The Sea Scroll takes elements of the Torah, it takes elements of the New Testament, elements of the Tanakh, elements of the Zabur, which by the way is just the book of Psalms, and elements of the Quran, but it contradicts all of them as well. In order for us to justify that, I would say the Sea Scroll holds to a different set of Gospels given to all of the Prophets that neither the Muslims, the Christians, nor the Jews ever received and that there is absolutely no archaeological, historical, or any other kind of evidence for. So this is kind of a weak argument. It's actually proved that Islam is the truth and that the Jews have some of the truth. Ah, 
Interesting. So now the rabbinic tradition is acceptable to you because it does match your book and there's no way to escape from that one. So you claim that the rabbinics have some form of truth in them. But how do you know which part of the truth is actually verifiable? And you can't just appeal to the Quran because that's circular logic. So how do we know which part of the rabbinic tradition is truthful? Because much of the rabbinic tradition spits on the name of Jesus and says that he is burning in hell. How come you don't accept those? But you so readily accept something that happens to have found its way into your book. I need to remind the audience, as well as this man here, that the Sunnis claim that the Quran is the eternal, uncaused word of God, which God always had with him in the Islamic theology. It is not a product of its time. It makes no sense for tens of thousands or maybe millions of years ago, Allah to have a Quran which is quoting so heavily, so accurately, from the late stage rabbinic traditions. Or you could claim that the rabbis happened to just grasp this magic that was floating in the air and just coincidentally happened to guess the revelation that would be later reviewed in the Quran. Either way, the eternality of the Quran makes this issue much more serious than any critique of the Bible, which we all admit was written by human prophets. Is the Bible plagiarizing the book of Enoch in the same way you try to accuse Hadith of plagiarizing the Talmud? Even in the footnote of the NIV version of the Bible, they completely admit that Jude 115 is from the Jewish first book of Enoch, approximately the first century BC. So next time, make sure to not live in a glass house if you're planning on throwing stones. Actually, we can throw whatever we want, because of the Bible we all claim was written by human authors. And the human authors can quote people who are not God when giving some kind of an analysis in their theological dissertation. Quoting somebody that is not God is acceptable in the Bible, because the Bible never claims that every word in it is literally a one-to-one -one correlation with the word of God. Now with Muslims you have a problem, because you say the Quran is the eternal, uncaused word of God, crafted or begotten we might say, before time immemorial, and then revealed to Muhammad at a certain date and time. So if this book is eternal, it should not have traces and very heavy elements of, for its time at least, contemporary rabbinism. If it is claiming to be an eternal book, why are there so many influences from the people that just so happened to be around it when the book was revealed? In addition to that, troubling enough as it is, these things that are asserted in the Quran do not match the theology of the Bible. Copying Plotinus when he says God is the one, the absolute, is a massive red flag because Plotinus's metaphysics or ontology are completely contrary to the ontology of the Bible. So Pythagorean metaphysics have now entered into the Quran, which are completely opposed by the biblical order. In addition to that, you have other things such as, like I said, the Talmud being copied when it appropriates the wrong type of theology and contradicts the tribalism of the Torah into what is supposed to be an eternal uncaused book. So yes, there are many books in the Bible that are talking about things that do not take place within the self-contained Bible, and that is perfectly acceptable, because the authors of these texts, as I said, they are human beings citing many different things, and the Bible is not the eternal, uncaused word of God which proceeds out of God. Rather, that would be Christ. Say, O Prophet, He is Allah one and indivisible. Allah the sustainer needed by all. He has never had offspring, nor was he born, and there is none comparable to him. This is exactly what I'm talking about. The Quran does not even understand the theology it's claiming to refute. Stating that God was never born, and God does not have any offspring, is assuming that God has to create offspring via procreation. Rather, what the Bible is using, as mentioned by the Apostle Paul, is accommodation to describe the concept of Jesus being the Son of God without meaning the exact same thing that we mean when a human being has a son. In addition to that, saying that there is absolutely nothing comparable to him is now once again leaning into Neoplatonism. If nothing at all is comparable to God, then how can we even say God is alive? For I am alive, I am a human. If God and I share that, then I would be comparable to him even in only a small way. How about even further? How come God can exist if I exist? If all humans exist and everything on earth exists, how can God then exist? Because he would then be in the language or the category of description which we also share. Which you're going to claim? He is outside of that category of description. Which is exactly what the commentary on Imam at tahawis material says. That God is beyond the category of, of description of existing and therefore he's not something 
because if he were something, he would be like creation, which he cannot be, because he's eternally juxtaposed from creation. And that in itself is also copied from the metaphysics of Plato. So before you start running around claiming that everybody is a pagan, you should look at yourself and realize that paganism does not always have to be polytheism. In fact, some of the most damaging paganism in this entire world comes from people who only believed in one god. And those people were not the prophets of the Jews, not the shepherds that God gave revelation to, but rather the madmen of Hellenistic extremism.